In the last program on the history of ancient Greece, we were introduced to some of the more famous Bronze Age civilizations of the Aegean region, including those of the Minoans and the Mycenaeans. We also saw that during the latter part of the Bronze Age, or roughly between 1550 to around 1200 BC, the Mycenaean civilization was dominant on both the Greek mainland and in the wider Aegean region. Then, around 1190 BC, Mycenaean civilization rapidly declined and then collapsed altogether. The ruins of several Mycenaean sites throughout mainland Greece, including, but certainly not limited to Mycenae, Tiryns, Medea, Pylos, and Thebes, all show evidence of severe, intentional destruction, and often by fire. Whatever the cause, the destruction and overall abandonment of most of these settlements was permanent. So, what exactly happened? To be honest, we're not totally sure. Regardless of what some people may tell you, there's actually no scholarly consensus as to what caused the collapse of Mycenaean civilization. There are several hypotheses, and some of them may be more popular than others, but as of now, there's no, you could say, smoking gun as to what the culprit of such destruction and the mass exodus that followed really was. Classical Greek and later Roman historians claim that the collapse of Mycenaean civilization was due to a people called the Dorians, who were said to have invaded the country from the northwest. Even scholars as late as the 20th century agreed with this account, and there are a few who still do. The problem with this, though, is that modern archaeology has yet to confirm the evidence of such an invasion or even a mass migration of a new people entering into the region around the same time as the Mycenaean collapse. Due to this, many scholars recently have argued that instead of the Dorians invading the Mycenaean kingdoms, they were actually already present in Mycenaean society as a sort of lower class, much like serfs. This is supported by linguistic elements of the Dorian dialect that can be found in the Greek of Linear B, the written language of the Mycenaeans. This hypothesis proposes that the Dorians may have rebelled and overthrown the Mycenaean warrior elite that oppressed them, which led to chaos and eventually the destruction of Mycenaean cities all over Greece and the Aegean. Other hypotheses and theories abound. Some believe that there may have been widespread famine, while others contend that perhaps a great war, like the Trojan War described in Homer's Iliad, may have put such a strain on the Mycenaean economy that shortly afterward, it simply imploded and led to the rapid decline and fall of civilization itself. What is known is that the collapse of the Mycenaean world pretty much happened in tandem with the widespread destruction of other civilizations throughout the Eastern Mediterranean between the years 1200 to 1150 BC. Historians refer to these series of events as the Late Bronze Age Collapse, which along with Mycenaean Greece, saw the total destruction of many cities and kingdoms in the eastern Mediterranean, the fall of the mighty Hittite Empire in Anatolia, as well as the great weakening of Egypt and the loss of its empire in the Levant. There's a good deal of evidence that indicates that Mycenaean Greeks may have left the Greek mainland during this time to join the bands of migrants and marauders collectively known as the Sea Peoples. One piece of evidence that links the Mycenaeans to the Sea Peoples is that the Greek dialect of ancient Cyprus is strikingly similar to the Greek that was spoken in much of the Peloponnese at that time, perhaps indicating that Mycenaean Greeks had settled in Cyprus. Another is that one of the groups of the Sea Peoples called the Peliset by the Egyptians, known to most of us as the Philistines, may have been the descendants of Mycenaean Greeks who ended up in the southern Levant. This link is made due to the numerous amounts of pottery found at the earliest or foundational levels of many Philistine cities that just happen to bear a very striking resemblance to Mycenaean pottery. We may never know for sure what exactly transpired between the years 1200 to 1150 BC, but by 1100 BC, society in Greece had completely changed. Though the remnants of their massive walls and other structures may have remained, the once great Mycenaean cities of Mycenae, Tiryns, and Pylos, if they were still populated at all, had been reduced 
to small villages. This essentially was the start of what historians call the Dark Age of Ancient Greece, which most scholars place roughly between 1100 to 750 BC. The Greek Dark Age was at a time, along with the absence of written records, where there was a great decline in what had once been Mycenaean civilization. For example, no new palaces were built, the creation of art or sculpture of any kind had greatly diminished, the once expansive trade networks had been severely broken, and, perhaps most significant for us, knowledge of writing, in this case Linear B, died out. Not only this, but there was massive population decline nearly everywhere on the mainland, perhaps as much as 90% in some areas, according to various estimates. Most people seem to have moved from the great, once fortified walled cities into more isolated villages that began to dot the hills and mountains of Greece. Here, they resorted to herding animals and whatever little farming they could do in such rocky terrain. Basically, the Dark Age was not a time of great technological or cultural achievement. Or was it? While it's true that the post-Mycenaean world of Dark Age Greece was not the most wealthy or cosmopolitan place, archaeological findings, especially in more recent decades, have shown that progress was made in several areas. One of the most important advancements during that time was the adoption of iron for making weapons and tools. Before that, such items were mostly made out of bronze, but probably sometime between 1100 and 900 BC, objects made of iron became the norm. This may have also been out of necessity. In order to create bronze, the Mycenaeans had to import copper and tin from abroad. However, when these trade networks broke down after the Late Bronze Age collapse, the Greeks were able to utilize the plethora of iron ore that could be mined from the mountains in their own country. Due to this, iron eventually replaced bronze as the go-to metal for daily life, including farming tools, which led to greater harvests and an overall increase in the food supply. By around 1000 BC, things began to improve throughout Greece and gradually, instead of declining, the population actually began to increase. In fact, in some areas, the population had grown so much that many Greeks started migrating to some of the lesser inhabited islands of the Aegean, as well as founding settlements along the western shores of Anatolia in what's today Turkey. This area later became known as Ionia, since it was initially colonized by a group of Greeks known as Ionians, many of whom came from Athens and the surrounding areas between 1050 to 950 BC. In 1964, a remarkable discovery was made at the village of Lefkandi, about an hour's drive north of Athens. There, a medium-sized structure dating to the 10th century BC was uncovered of what appears to have been some sort of heroic burial. Archaeologists are not exactly sure if this was a shrine dedicated to the man buried beneath, or perhaps a house that once belonged to him and was later turned into a shrine. What is apparent, though, is that the individual laid to rest here, both with a woman believed to have been his wife and four horses, was of high status. Along with the bodies were several luxury items, including some from Cyprus and others from as far away as Mesopotamia, indicating that by this time, at least in this particular area, there may have been some sort of international trade going on. It should be noted that the revitalization of the economy, as well as the technological and cultural advancements just mentioned, were not uniform throughout the mainland. It was really the coastal regions that prospered first, especially in the eastern Aegean, and only later did change slowly trickle into the regions of Greece's mountainous interior. Between 900 to 700 BC, we also see a new type of art style featured on pottery that we today call geometric ware. The name is due to the geometric patterns that were used to decorate these ceramic objects, though eventually figures, generally painted in black, began to appear, as well as scenes from daily life, mythology, depictions of animals, and scenes of war. By around 800 BC, the archaeological record gives us more indications of things picking up in and around Greece, and a relatively common Greek culture, identity, and values 
taking hold amongst the general population. This doesn't mean that they were in any way politically unified, just that they all shared similar characteristics that we today identify as being uniquely Greek. It's also around this time, or shortly afterward, that both the Greek alphabet was first adopted, as well as the first Olympic Games held in Olympia, Greece. So, we have a lot to talk about in the next few programs, especially with regard to the Greek alphabet and how it was a game changer for Greek civilization. We'll also get into a new era of Greek history, the Archaic Period. These topics and more, all coming up on future episodes of the History of Ancient Greece. Stay tuned. As always, thanks so much for stopping by, I really appreciate it. I'd also like to sincerely thank GrandKek69, Pasta Frola, Michael Lewis, and all of the channel's patrons on Patreon for helping to support this and all of the content coming up as we finish up 2020 and head into 2021. Check out the benefits of being a Patreon member, and if you'd like to join, feel free to click the link in the video description. In addition, check out the History with Sai podcast, where I go into more detail with regard to topics discussed on the channel. You can also follow History with Sai on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. Thanks again, stay safe, and all the best for 2021.